Welcome, friend. Follow me. We're going somewhere dark, somewhere dangerous. Most people would never dare enter the place we are going. There's no telling what horrors we'll find, what terrors we'll uncover. Don't say I didn't warn you. We might discover terrible monsters lurking there. Be careful, they could follow you out. Or maybe they're already inside you. Are you afraid? Good. Now you are ready to enter the Warning Woods. In 1983, a student named Michael Mender committed suicide in the East Tower dorm. He had only been a freshman, just peeking into his second semester. In high school, Mike had led the track team to the state championships twice, both times bringing home the trophy. He hadn't been a bad student either. He didn't make valedictorian, but he did the next best thing and took her to the prom. Her name was Lily Lysensky. She and Mike had been steady since detasseling corn together over the summer between their sophomore and junior years. Everyone assumed the star couple, Mike the bright, handsome athlete and Lily the brilliant, beautiful scholar, would get married and go on to make millions before settling down and making a picture-perfect family. What no one, especially Mike, saw coming was the letter Lily sent him just after New Year's. Lily ever the overachiever, had taken a brief internship in Houston with a big marketing firm. The firm wouldn't have ordinarily taken a freshman, but her outstanding resume and track record for excellence had won them over. She was supposed to stay in Houston from the end of the fall 82 semester until the beginning of spring 83. But her letter, that Dear John trope, told Mike otherwise. Dear Michael, you have meant the world to me. I don't know how I would have gotten through high school without you. And while you still mean the world to me, I'm writing this to tell you we must move on from one another. Living in Houston this past month has opened my eyes to just how big the world is. There are so many opportunities. There are so many people. I want college to be a time of exploration and excitement. I don't want to spend the next four years knowing how they will end. I'm sure the life we had planned would have been wonderful, but right now, at this stage in life, I need the thrill of an open ending. I hope you understand. Love always, Lily. A clear-minded person such as yourself might read that letter and think it sounds perfectly reasonable. We all know young love has about as much chance in this world as a turtle crossing a four-lane highway. But when Mike read the letter, all he retained was, there are so many people. I want college to be a time of exploration. I just need the thrill. The clear image of some Stetson-wearing Houston boy smiling across a diner at Lily haunted Mike. He pictured the boy's shirt open at the top, showing off the lines of his hardened chest and a tuft of dark hair wisping out like smoke. He pictured Lily sitting in her chair, wanting to explore. Wanting the thrill. The thrill that Mike was apparently unable to give her. At least, not anymore. Mike's suicidal ideations began not with the heartbreak of being dumped, but with those lingering thoughts. She had unintentionally made him feel lesser. He was just another guy in a world stuffed full of another guys. He was unworthy of love, even from someone who had professed to love him for years. He was unexciting. He had no thrill. Mike knew some of those things were true, but he hadn't previously considered them issues. He had always thought of Lily as the type of girl who liked a stable, albeit somewhat boring, guy to go with. Mike's final moments were pretty easy to put together, since the letter was still in his hand when another student found his arm two feet from the East Tower's front door. The pulpy mass of bones, tissue, and fabric that had been the rest of Mike's body was a few feet further inside, laying in the center of the dorm's rectangular stairwell. Mike had seemingly read that letter, that unintended death sentence, one final time before leaping over the 16th floor guardrail. On his way down, Mike's shoulder connected with the rail on the 5th floor. That's probably why his arm came off when he landed. With all that momentum, he put a V-shaped dent in the metal rail. 
Later on, the maintenance guys came by and mostly straightened it out, but a lumpy white crease remained in the metal. If you ran your fingers over it, you could feel the bump where the metal had been compressed and then stretched back out again. Rumors began to fly immediately, of course. And since this happened in the 80s before cell phones and social media allowed people to commit rumors to broadly distributed text, a game of telephone began. One student told another that if you touched the crease before you went to bed, you would see Mike falling in your dreams. And 15 students later, if you touched the crease at midnight, Mike would haunt you forever. Another rumor began as, if you touch the crease and say Mike's name three times, he will appear somewhere in the stairwell. That one became, if you touch the crease and say Mike's name three times, he appears and kills someone you love. This rumor quickly died off since there wasn't a rash of unexplained deaths on campus though. However, a disturbing number of students had given the sick game a whirl despite its purported consequences. The rumors were all like branches of a tree, growing out and out, getting thinner and weaker, eventually becoming a flimsy leaf that dries up and falls to the ground to get chopped up by a lawnmower and never seen again. The trunk, however, has stood strong through the decades. The one sturdy, unchanging element to every story and rumor was you had to touch the crease in the guardrail. So I did. Look, the story of Mike Mender is this school's worst kept secret. I resisted going up to the fifth floor of the East Tower dorm my entire freshman year, but I wouldn't have been able to put it off for four whole years. It was on my mind the second I returned to campus this fall. It doesn't help that I live in the West Tower, which looks identical to the East Tower on the inside. Every time I ascended past the fifth floor in my building, I would let my hand brush against the unblemished guardrail and wonder about that singular difference between our two buildings. And so, in mid-September, I huffed my backpack the extra tenth of a mile to the East Tower after a long day of sitting distractedly in class. My books felt twice as heavy as I climbed the first couple flights of stairs. Their weight had tripled by the time I reached the fourth floor, and on the fifth, on the fifth their weight evaporated. I became unaware of anything besides the obtuse angle in the guardrail and the mystery at its vertex. I found the infamous crease almost at the dead center of the rail. Rust had started to eat away at the weakened metal. Two cracks had formed vertically on either side of the old crease. I wondered how long it would be before the university finally decided it was time to replace that old rail. I couldn't believe they hadn't already. I felt like I should have said something thoughtful, or maybe stood in a moment of silence for poor Michael Mender, but instead, I just reached out and put the index finger of my right hand on the crease. My skin got caught in one of those rusty cracks, and I suffered a small cut down the middle of my fingertip. Fortunately, I had recently updated my tetanus shot. The image of my own blood smeared on that place where Michael Mender had collided on his way to meet death is permanently affixed to the walls of my memory. Whenever I think back on that day, that image is prominently displayed like the Mona Lisa at the Louvre. My pain, although brief and merely physical, met Mike's that day. Suffering recognizes suffering, no matter how mismatched. When I descended back to the fifth floor, the weight of my books left me again, but this time it was because I dropped them. I stopped so suddenly at the top of the last flight of stairs that my backpack just slid right off my shoulders, and I let it. I didn't even slow its fall because the twisted body of a male student lay on the floor just a few steps away. Blood was pooling from his cheek and the sinewy stump where his left arm had been. That arm now lay near the front door clutching a letter. I closed my eyes, squeezed them shut, but Mike Mender was still there when I opened them again. I couldn't just stand there forever, so I forced myself to step over Mike's body and arm. I let out a small yelp when I thought I saw the graying arm twitch. I even heard the paper rustle in its hand. I thought I would be safe once I got outside, but my engagement with death would not end in the East Tower. I went straight back to my room in the West Tower, 7th floor. After ditching my bag on my bed, 
I went out to the lounge to see if any of my friends were around to hear my story. Every floor in the dorm has its own lounge so students can meet people and have somewhere to hang out when their roommates need privacy. The three couches arranged in a broken U-shape are rough to the touch and smell like a human attic, but are still satisfyingly plushy even after decades of use. I didn't find any friends in the lounge, but I did find a student I didn't recognize passed out on the middle couch. I almost turned back to my room, but I noticed this student's clothes and stopped for a closer look. He wore baggy jeans that didn't at all fit current trends. His red flannel shirt harkened back to the early days of grunge when all the big bands still had living singers. But it was the t-shirt underneath the unbuttoned flannel that had caught my eye. It read, Journalism Club, 1991 in rounded text that wrapped around a graphic representation of one of the older buildings on campus. Of course, this student may have found all of these items at a thrift store where many of us bought our clothes, but even his shaggy hairstyle, literally like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, screamed 90s. Then I saw the pills. Two white circles had gotten stuck between his downturned chin and his shoulder. A few more were wedged under his arm. I saw an open orange bottle in his left hand, and I knew. This student was not sleeping. I immediately dialed 911 and told the operator there had been a suicide on floor 7 of the West Tower. She told me an ambulance was on the way and asked me to check the guy's pulse. I reached down for his wrist, but he disappeared along with the bottle and pills as soon as my fingertips reached his skin. I locked up as the operator asked me again and again if I was still there. Finally, I broke from my stupor and told the operator there had been a mistake. No suicide had been committed. That was, of course, untrue. But I didn't think an ambulance in 2022 would be able to save a student in 1991. The operator sounded reasonably concerned at my sudden change of mind. She told me she would still have the ambulance come by, just in case. In the background, I heard her request an officer head toward the West Tower as well. I hung up the phone and ran. I left the building entirely and pretended to go for a stroll as the ambulance and a cop showed up. The cop and two paramedics went into the West Tower for about 20 minutes and came out shaking their heads. I felt sorry for wasting their time, but my intentions had been good. That student had looked so real. So had Mike Mender. It dawned on me as I watched the ambulance drive away that I had been cursed. It wasn't a peaceful, picturesque dawning either. It was Red Dawn. Dawn of the Dead. To test a theory, I took the bus across town. There's an alley behind the First National Bank where a student was robbed in 2012. The kid called the robber's bluff about having a gun under his jacket, but didn't count on the man having a five-inch knife instead. I figured it would be easy to find the exact place the kid bled out and died because the locals still put flowers there on the kill anniversary, even though the murder occurred nearly a decade before. Sure enough, as I walked down that alley, I found dried up bouquets and a prickly desiccated wreath on the ground. Thankfully, that's all I found. No drained corpses, no puddles of blood, nothing but flimsy memorials of the alley's appalling past. So it was only suicide victims I could see. I thought I could manage that. I mean, how often have people committed suicide in public places? How often did they do it at all? I figured if I stuck to campus like I normally did, I would be fine. I wouldn't go exploring any more dormitories or back alleys. For me, it would be straight to class and straight home. Have you ever heard something splash in the water and turned only in time to see the ripples left in the wake of the actual impact? It's funny to think how many more ripples than splashes we see in our lives. For each splash, there are dozens of tiny waves. Some are so small we can't even detect them, even though we technically see them. I bring this up because, as it turns out, suicide is like a splash, and it too ripples. I learned this lesson during the course of my sophomore year, because while I could avoid looking at the splash by keeping my eyes straight forward, the ripples crept into my peripheral vision and lapped the edges of my awareness until I could not ignore them. There's my classmate Vera, who smiles and laughs often. 
Despite what her face and voice portray, her constant, insufferable pain is betrayed by her eyes. Her eyes always look void and distant, like she's seen the ghost of a loved one she thought was still alive. And perhaps she is seeing a ghost in her mind. I learned her father had taken a bath with her hairdryer days before her high school graduation. Landon, my roommate, kept his personal life under lock and key, but I learned his darkest secret anyway. He whispered it in his sleep. Not aloud, but in a way that I and I alone could hear. The knowledge of what his 19-year-old sister had done transferred to me like a psycho-digital download from Landon's subconscious. They all think it was an accident, but I know the truth. Only I know the truth. I found her note, the note she left for us all, but I found it and burned it while the police were still talking to mom and dad in the living room. She had been drunk, yes, but she crashed into that bridge on purpose. Eventually, I began to see, hear, and feel the ripples everywhere. The echoing, lingering pain of loss seemed to affect nearly everyone on campus. It's become all I can think about. I can't concentrate in class or focus on my coursework anymore. How had no one else who touched the crease noticed the change afterwards? How had they all gone about their lives with this burden? Had they all stepped over Michael Mender's body on their way out the door afterwards? No. No, they couldn't have. Some had claimed to see the body from the fifth floor, but no one I was aware of had ever mentioned him still being there when they left. Even if they had been blind to everything else, wouldn't they have talked about always seeing him lying there? I mentally revisited my trip to the East Tower. I thought of the cut on my index finger. It had healed by then, but my thumb still bumped a little when I ran it over my fingertip. That had to be it, I decided. My blood mixed with the rust. The crease had consumed my own cells, my essence, and the rust must have gotten into me too. The crease represented more than a single impact, a single death. The visible damage represented something much greater. The crease in the rail merely reflected the crease in the curtain separating life and death that Michael Mender created that fateful day in 1983. A dent in the metal, a tear in the fabric of reality. Mike's suicide and all the others had made us next-door neighbors to death instead of distant acquaintances. I knew it was a long shot, but I wondered if I could go back and clean my blood off that rusty, broken rail. I longingly pondered whether such an action might free me from the burden of everyone's suffering. And so I returned to the fifth floor of the East Tower, having to step over Mike Mender and his twitching arm once more, and saw that I hadn't been the only person to notice the rusty cracks in the old guardrail. Where the macabre reminder had been only weeks before, a shiny, straight, new rail now gleamed. I know in a couple of months I'll be packing to return home for the holiday break. I'm not sure I want to go. Here on campus, I'm surrounded by strangers. Their pain is obvious to me, but with time, I've grown to accept and ignore it. Will I be able to bear seeing it on my mother's face, in my father's eyes? What about Mr. Mayfield, our mailman? or the neighbors I've known since I was a small child. What am I supposed to do when confronted with all of their pain and the knowledge that they must live with it every day? You made it out. Congratulations. If you enjoyed the story, please rate and review this podcast wherever you like to listen. Reviews are the best way to support the podcast and help it grow. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash thewarningwoods. If you want more creepy content, including the images that accompany each story, follow me on Instagram at thewarningwoods. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the warning woods. Thank you for listening.